Meet Marcus Limonis, the multimillionaire who'd spend $2 million of his own money to fix a failing business and transform the people who run it. And if you don't like it, you can pack your and you can go home. The Profit, Tuesdays, CNBC Prime. Hi everybody, welcome to On The Money. I'm Maria Bartiromo. The market's taken August breather. Is this the beginning of a summer swoon or is it time to get in? Why one stock strategist says, get ready for a 15 year bull run. The man who founded Amazon.com buys an iconic newspaper. Can Jeff Bezos do for journalism what he did for retail? And he plays a technology superstar in the movies. But is he that different in real life? My conversation with actor and investor Aston Kutcher. On the Money begins right now. This is America's number one financial news program. On the Money. Now, Maria Bartiromo. Here's a look at what's making news as we head into a new week on the money. President Obama took his economic show on the road this week, pitching housing reform in Phoenix. Mr. Obama called the winding down the government-sponsored entities Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, which hold most of the mortgages in the United States. He called for a limited government role and an increase in private lending in the housing market. For too long, these companies were allowed to make huge profits buying mortgages, knowing that if their bets went bad, taxpayers would be left holding the bag. Meanwhile, the markets broke a three-day slide on Thursday, catching their breath and consolidating a bet. It was the longest losing streak in more than a month. The markets fell on Friday. Earnings season is winding down. Disney beat analysts' expectations, though its revenues fell short. 21st Century Fox had its first earnings report since it was split from News Corp, and the company beat expectations, as did AOL and Time Warner. A poor performance for many small cars in an important safety test. Meanwhile, half of the vehicles tested by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety did not do well. Nissan Sentra was rated poor, as were Kia's Soul and Forte models. The Honda Civic was the only small car to get a good rating. The markets actually took a moment to catch their breath this week. Is it the beginning of a summer slowdown or a good time to dive in? Joining me right now to talk stocks and investing, Marianne Bartels is chief investment officer at Merrill Lynch Wealth Management, and Mike Santoli is senior columnist at Yahoo Finance. Good to have you both on the program. I'm right. Good to Hi. see you. Thanks so much. So the markets, uh, well, feel like they're taking a breather this week. We had uh, the first a three-day losing streak in more than a month. Do you think this is the beginning of a consolidation, Marianne? It's possible, Maria. Markets often um, peak in the summer months, and then the worst month of the year is actually September. And we do have some things going on in September. We're going to have to address, like, the debt ceiling, um, new fiscal budget for next year. So we might see another dip within the market, but we remain long-term bulls at Merrill Lynch. It is a busy month. Maybe it makes sense to take some chips off the table, Mike. Well, it definitely is logical that it would be a point when you anticipate all these things for a kind of a tired market maybe to, to pull back. We've had like three of these sideways to down uh, sort of relatively shallow pullbacks this year, and uh, they never really kind of flourished into a, a full-blown correction. And I do kind of see it uh, August and September as being a logical place for some of that backing off activity. I want to talk about tapering for a minute because, you know, we all know that the Federal Reserve put some markers in place to indicate the place that they, the time that they would begin to roll down the stimulus, and that includes 6.5% unemployment, an inflation target of 2%. We're not near any of those things, but this week I spoke with Richard Fisher, the chairman and CEO of the Dallas Federal Reserve. Listen to what he had to say about the tapering. Personally, I think it is timely, assuming the data keeps moving in the direction it's been going, for us to begin to dial back the monetary accommodation we provided for the system. Now, he is not a voting member this year. He said, personally, my opinion. Do you think the tapering begins in September? Actually, our firm does not think it's going to happen in September. We think it's more likely in December. Obviously, we didn't rule out September. But as you pointed out, we don't even have that inflation target yet of 2%. We're still running about, you know, 1.3%. I agree with you. I can't imagine in about 40 days from today, the Federal Reserve starts, starts cutting the number of uh, bond purchases. But Mike, you made a really important point this week. I, I think I, I heard you on CNBC and you said maybe just the idea of talking about it was the beginning. Yep. What do you see? How do you see it playing? Well, I do think that basically the Fed has conditioned investors uh, in terms of what to expect. And they've been on the same page in saying tapering is not tightening. You know, those thresholds you mentioned, six and a half percent unemployment, a two percent inflation target. That's the those are the thresholds for the Fed to actually lift interest rates. Right. So they keep wanting to distinguish between the amount of bonds they're buying every month and the ultimate 
increase in short-term rates, which is way, way, way off. So I do think the market's kind of gotten this message that uh, the Fed wants to remain uh, accommodative. I think a lot hinges on August's employment number, obviously. You know, even what President Fisher said right there in the interview was assuming the economic numbers continue to go the way they are. So we're still dependent on that. Marion, Bank of America Merrill Lynch had a uh, published paper this week that had some interesting findings in terms of cash and research and development in in the U.S. compared to the rest of the world. The U.S. spends more on R&D than all of Asia and Europe combined. That's correct. So really what um, we wanted to look at a number of months ago, um, the media was saying that the U.S. was losing its advance in U.S. innovation. So we looked at some of the fundamental factors of what is innovation. We looked at R&D spending as well. And when you look at companies that are actually investing in R&D, their stocks tend to outperform. And if you break it down even into technology, those companies that are expending on R&D versus not actually outperform the ones that don't by 10%. So is this part of the reason you're still bullish on stocks? Yeah, well, p- part of the reason. The market is not that um, expensive. In fact, earnings actually hit a record high in 2010. We think the market is just starting to catch up to the fundamentals. And Maria, when you study market history, it takes investors a long time after you've been in a range-bound market to gain confidence. And we're just at Merrill Lynch starting to see the individual investors investor come back to the market. And we're talking about the great rotation, getting the backup in the, in the interest rates over a period of time, and trying to find areas where we can build wealth for our clients. And we don't feel that that's going to happen in the fixed income component. Certainly, you're not earning anything in cash. So we see the long-term um, bullish story really being in the equity market. You know, it's interesting because you had so much money, billions, tens of billions of dollars coming out of the bond market, but it has yet to find its home in stocks. We're waiting for this great rotation. Are you expecting that? to take place? I do expect it, but it's a grudging. It's not something that seems like it's being pursued with a lot of uh, aggression or enthusiasm. I think, look, there's a natural reaction that people see the market at all-time highs, and there's a psychological element of, do you want to actually you know, put money to work fresh it, at all-time highs. It happens over time. I, I agree with Marianne that it's, this recognition phase is what we're in right now. So you don't think that the market has seen the best days for 2013 at this point? No, we're still forecasting a year-end target of 1750. Actually, our technical department get a little bit higher around uh, 1755. On the S&P 500. That is correct. But I think what investors need to start thinking about is the equity market in a new secular bull market. What that means is that the rise in stocks will happen over a number of years. And we are arguing at Merrill Lynch that we are in a new secular bull market. And when you go into a new secular bull market, Maria, it can last for 15 years. You get corrections, of course, but we feel any correction, meaningful correction in the market is a buying opportunity. Good to have you both on the program. Thanks, Maria. Thank you so much, Marion Bartels, Mike Santoli. Up next on The Money, what is the new hobby of the super rich? Newspapers, it appears, with two major dailies sold in fire sales this week. While it's headline news today, does it make sense for the bottom line tomorrow? We will find out. Later, the New York Stock Exchange got a little star power this week when Ashton Kutcher dropped in. The actor and prolific angel investor offering his take on portraying the founder of one of the world's most valuable companies. It terrified me. Steve Jobs was a pretty complicated character. Welcome back. It is making front page news. One of technology's best is getting into the newspaper business. Amazon founder and CEO Jeff Bezos acquired the Washington Post this week for $250 million at a time when newspaper revenues have hit a 50-year low. What is Bezos seeing that other publishers may not be? Kara Swisher is co-executive editor of All Things Digital and a veteran of the Washington Post. Kara, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. How's it going? Good. So why do you think Jeff Bezos was interested in the Post, especially considering he acquired it at an indiv- as an individual rather than having Amazon buy it? Yeah, I, I think it would have been very difficult for the company to buy it. They've already, you know, they're already doing so many different experiments that are, you know, costly. Jeff is someone that's putting off profits for uh, a lot of growth, and I think that would have pushed investors over the edge uh, if the company itself bought it. Yeah, that makes sense. But, but, yeah. but do you think that with his e-commerce experience, he can actually reinvent the newspaper the way he reinvented retail and publishing? I'm not so sure. I don't think they're going to start selling, uh, you know, Kindles uh, from the Washington Post. I, I don't know what that means. I mean, I think he has some ideas about probably circulation and, and distributing the, the paper that he, he knows about very well. So, I mean, you know, what's interesting to me is five or six years ago, um, Rupert Murdoch, 
acquired yes. the Wall Street Journal for five billion dollars, and here yeah. we are five years later. Bezos is paying two hundred fifty million right. uh, for the Washington Post. That's a real fire sale. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, or else Rupert Murdoch paid too much, probably. Yeah. I mean, right now, I think the what's happened in the past five years, though, you think about it, is the, the, the value of a print publication has gone down precipitously, you know, as online publications have have risen, and but the but the prices are still kind of skewed because the money coming into online publications isn't quite the same as is going out of newspapers. So you actually started out in the mailroom at the Washington Post. I did. You worked I did. your way up at a time when tech, the tech scene was just beginning with AOL. Yes. Yeah, I was very good at it. I just want to say. <laughs> what 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 did you see at the Washington Post? Did you see missteps? Uh, you mentioned in a, in a recent uh, piece that that uh, Don Graham bought personal shares of Facebook in yeah. 2005, but not on the uh, on behalf of the company. He he got them as a director, actually. <clears throat> Excuse me, and they're going to charity. So let's be fair to him. Um, but he the Washington Post had a deal to buy a, uh, in one of the early rounds of Facebook. And he, um, Mark Zucker asked him to give it to Excel Partners. And I think that he was very honorable and did what Mark wanted. But the Washington Post, if they were very aggressive, had an opportunity to be very in very early in Facebook. And, and those shares would have been worth billions of dollars. Well, you've got the other, uh, another billionaire, Red Sox owner John Henry, yeah. invested in newspapers this week. He paid $70 million for the Boston Globe. Mm -hmm. uh, so people like him, Bezos, Warren Buffett, are newspapers now the playthings for the very rich? Or do you believe they're taking them on as serious investments? Is, is it just telling us that content is king? How do you see it? Um, I think that content is king and what you could do with these fantastic brand names. There's still Boston Globe is still a fantastic brand name. The Washington Post is a tremendous brand name. You know, John Henry actually got it for not even $70 million because there was a $110 million pension fund. So it was worth $40 million in losses for the New York Times to move it along, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. The, the delivery of content is, is an important area. And if they can manage to keep these losses or make them, you know, the cash flow is positive. These, some of these companies uh, make money, um, not very much money, but the cash flow is positive, that they could do something interesting. Fewer and fewer are actually reading the, the uh, actual newspaper. We know that printing is expensive. Right. How come newspapers just don't go all digital? I mean, are, are there I, other I, issues we're not seeing? I don't know. I, I said that in the piece. They might as well just do that. Because I think that, that doesn't mean you have to get rid of print products. If there's good opportunities to do print products, do them. It's not like you have to have be religious about this. But the question is, do, you, do, do, do the new consumers, especially young people, re, they, they love news. People love news. News has not gotten out of style. It's grown. Online news consumption is, has exploded. It's they don't like the delivery medium. And so if they don't like print, why force it down their throats? And why don't you find really innovative ways, given that there's tablets and cell phones and everything else to get this stuff and televisions and all kinds of things coming? Why not try to focus on that? What would your advice be to Jeff Bezos and John Henry to turn around their papers? I would stop the presses. I got to tell you, I, I know I got a little bit of, I, I put it in that piece. Um, I would try to hire people that like the internet. A lot of uh, people in print publications still really despise the internet. Even though they embrace it, they tweet, they, they try to like get around it, they put out digital versions. It's always a second part. You know, the fact that you use the word blog anymore, I mean, it's all, I mean, re there's some really good journalism going on online. It's, it's, it's the same, it, they have to think of it as a living news organization. And, and you've got to bring in people that know how to do that, that are native to this. And it doesn't have to be young people, by the way. It has to be people that are, understand the change that's being made. And it's akin to, to me, it's like, you know, the people that just didn't like them cars. I mean, if anyone around then, there was probably a lot of argument about cars, like I like my horse. <laughs> you know, you just, you just have to say this is the future and this is the way we have to be. And you have to get people in there that are creative and interested and also still love ethics, fair, fairness, accuracy, and things like that. Absolutely. Keep, keep journalism uh, at, at the top, but the distribu uh, distribution is clearly changing. Kara, good to have you on the program. Thanks All so right. much. Thanks we'll so see lot. you soon. Thanks. Kara Swisher. Up next, we're on the money from Dude, Where's My Car? to taking a bite out of Apple. Ashton Kutcher is playing Steve Jobs in a new film and putting his own money to work, investing in today's technology game changers. Nobody wants to buy a computer. Nobody. How does somebody know what they want if they've never even seen it? Actor Ashton Kutcher has made headlines for his film career and celebrity, but now he's all business with a new role as the late Apple founder, Steve Jobs. Kutcher's no stranger to risk in the hope of reward. 
He has a venture capital fund and has invested in more than two dozen startup companies, making his portrayal of one of the leading figures of the digital era the role of a lifetime. Apple. Excuse me? Apple, Apple like the fruit? The fruit of creation. It terrified me, um, and I've usually found that the, the greatest rewards in my life come from taking on things that are a little bit scary. And what this film is about is the, the, the notion that life isn't just something that you live in, it's something that you build. We've designed something wonderful. The user can move an arrow around on the screen and simply point to English words. And How do you prepare for such a role? Steve Jobs is a pretty complicated character um, and, and somewhat a psychologically complicated guy. And people already have a preconceived notion as to who he was and how he was. And it's usually the guy wearing the blue jeans and the black turtleneck and the New Balance with the round glasses and the shaved head. But understanding that Steve Jobs wasn't always that guy, uh, and that he became that guy, and we're constantly refining ourselves and our personas throughout our life, I felt like it was important to sort of really live in his shoes. I, I was reading that you made a 10-hour sound file of, of his voice. Yeah, there's a platform called SoundCloud, and they have this great index of Steve Jobs content over the years. What is a computer? The first story is about connecting the dots. And I just compiled them and listened to them while I was sleeping and driving in my car and 24 hours a day. And there were certain things that I was able to find that were patterns that were repeated that he said again and again and again. And, and if he said it publicly again and again and again, he was probably saying it privately 10 times as much. And he had a brutal, blunt honesty uh, that a lot of people, I think, are afraid to have. And I think it, it, was, it was his strength, but it was always, at, at some points, it was also his fault. We gotta make the small things unforgettable. Typeface isn't a pressing issue. Get out. When he gave feedback to people, he didn't care whether or not they liked him. He cared whether or not it was, what it was that they were doing was making his product better. You play the role of Steve Jobs, but you're also a real technologist yourself. You've invested, your, your venture fund has invested upwards of, is it $200 million into 30 startups? The collective portfolio is like $100 million. So how did you come to know about tech so much, be able to pick out winners? How do you do it? Well, the first thing we look for is uh, the density of the problem that they're solving. So we're not looking for companies you know, off the bat that, are, that we go, oh, that company's going to make a, X amount of money and it has X market cap. The second thing we look for um, are uh, extraordinary entrepreneurs. Um, you know, a lot of these companies that, that we invest in, they are two guys in a garage with a PowerPoint and a dog. You know, and do they have passion for the, the problem they're trying to solve? Um, do they have the kind of willpower that's going to take them through the challenges? And, and you found that in companies like uh, Airbnb and, and Uber and Spotify. And every once in a while you hear that idea and you just go, oh, that's obvious. Airbnb being one of them. You have an opportunity now um, because we have this layer of trust that's been built by these social networks where you have implicit trust because you know someone's a friend of a friend. So there's, there's, uh, there's product that can be sold on that network uh, to a willing buyer. How much of your life is investing and how much is it, you know, your, your acting career? It, it feels like you are m very, very knee deep in, in investing and actually finding these new ideas. Is that taking a shift in, in, in the way you spend your days? In, in essence, they're very similar processes. Um, most of the investing I do is in consumer facing technologies. And most of the advising I do on behalf of those companies is around their consumer product and the way that people will relate to a, a product. And that's really similar to acting in so much as you have to understand the psychology and the wants of a character. And I, I don't really think that there's a bifurcation between technology and art. And I think Steve Jobs was probably the greatest example of that. Steve Jobs was an artist, but he was also a technologist. He looked for people that weren't only great engineers, but they were also you know, poets or they were also painters. And they had a sense of artistic design. When can you get your hands on this? Today. So you like him. After learning all about him, do you like him? Do you feel like he's that complicated, really? I love him. Um, you know, he, he, while he was this great guy and this extreme leader uh, and achieved a level of genius and greatness that a lot of people try to attain to, he was still a person. And what makes people beautiful is, is their flaws. 
My thanks to Ashton Kutcher. Jobs is in theaters August 16th. Up next, a look at the news this upcoming week that will have an impact on your money. And then sharks in the limelight this shark week and summer. And one business is hoping to ride on their fins. Find out who after the break. Back in a moment. For more on our show and our guests, check out the website, otm.cnbc.com. And I hope you'll follow me on Twitter and on Google+. Look for at Maria Bartiromo. First, though, here's a look at the stories coming up in the week ahead that may move the market to impact your money this week. More quarterly earnings are on deck with Cisco, Macy's, Nordstrom, Walmart, and Kohl's all reporting their quarterly numbers. On Tuesday, retail sales for the month of July will be out. Also on Tuesday, Warren Buffett's Charity Buzz auction comes to an end. The highest bidder will meet with Buffett for an all-you-can-eat tour of C's Candy Factory, with proceeds going to communities in schools in Los Angeles. Wednesday, we get an idea of inflation when the producer price index for the month of July comes out, followed by the consumer price index on Thursday. On Friday, the very latest housing starts will be released. And finally today, from Sharknado to Shark Week, we simply can't get enough of our favorite sea predator. And one company is hoping to cash in on that popularity. In honor of Discovery Channel's hit Shark Week, Narragansett Beer is reintroducing a 1970s can design featured in the movie Jaws. At one point in the film, Captain Sam Quint, played by the late Robert Shaw, crushes a beer can with one hand. Narragansett is the 45th largest overall brewing company in America. We'll see if customers take the bait. That'll do it for us for today. Thanks so much for joining me. Next week, the American dream. Is it packed up in a moving truck? I'll tell you where it's headed. Each week, keep it right here, where we are on the money. Have a great week, everybody. I'll see you next weekend.